Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us in our webinar Wednesday series for federal government contractors. This is Jennifer from Jennifer Schausen Associates, and we're coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. In the month of January, we are covering the topic of cybersecurity. So a quick piece about our webinars. They are held every Wednesday. They're complimentary. The recordings are typically posted later in the evening or at least by the next business day on our website and also on our YouTube channel. We now have over 300 complimentary recorded government contracting webinars on our YouTube channel, so please be sure to follow us there to stay abreast of any new webinars that we post. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So our speaker today is David Dempsey, and he's got his contact information on the very last slide. He's got his phone number and email address, and I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you about any questions that you have about cybersecurity and CMMC. A quick blurb about us. We provide professional services for federal contractors. Some of the services are listed there and range from anything from TSA schedules to contract administration, marketing, and business development. You can find more information on our website. Uh, we do have an upcoming event February 10th at the Kennedy Center. Uh, we're going to have the State Department on site. They have confirmed attendance and about 150 federal contractors. Uh, you can attend as a government contractor or as a non-government contractor, and we do have sponsorships available, which would give you a compliment or would give you a table for your marketing materials, literature, uh, and any signage that you wanted to bring. Our newsletter now reaches almost uh, 17,000 subscribers uh, and includes government and government contractors. If you want pricing information about that, please send us an email to the email address that you see there on your screen. Okay, and our speaker today, as I mentioned, is David Dempsey. He's with uh, Dempsey Fontana. Their website is listed here, and he is covering CMMC, very hot topic and, uh, and timely as well. So, David, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to you and let you dig into your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, have called this uh, the dawn of CMMC and probably should have called it the bridge to CMMC. I'm assuming that several of you have heard enough to know about the, the apparent timeline of you know, by uh, by June of 2020, this will happen. In September, uh, they'll show up on RFPs and stuff. I'll get to that later. Uh, but what do you do in the meantime? And that's uh, pretty much what this is about. Plus, I'll go into how to prepare so that uh, you can, by the time the third party certifier comes to you, you can uh, go ahead and, and uh, get certified rather quickly. So we'll go through these first couple of slides uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the background is just to let you know that the Information Security Oversight Office at NARA is uh, actually, in, in practice, the main man behind all of this cybersecurity. And they are have a little more authority than you might think. That's why I put in here that the ISOO uh, revised the uh, National Industrial Security uh, Program a couple of years ago um, through uh, cooperation, of course, with the Defense uh, Counterintelligence uh, Security Agency. So if we go to the next slide, then there's the, the regulatory part. And the regulatory part, in, in, in this sense, means the standards that you've got to meet. And this is where I'll spend some time because that last two ask for a statement about revision B. Revision B is a supplement to the NIST 171 revision one, um, <clears throat> excuse me, site that I give above. And, and rather than say NIST special publication 800-171 Revision 1, I'm just going to say NIST 171. Uh, that's a supplement. And that's a supplement that adds 32 new security requirements. And this will be relevant to you when we get to talking about CMMC's uh, level 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's these new uh, security standards are put in, uh, are, are being put in place 
to address so-called high value assets. That this is all described when you know if you go to if you go to Google and put in this special publication 801-71 website will come up to NIST and they'll you'll see the the link to revision B and the, the explanation that they give is, is largely what this is taken for. Uh, high value assets are what's called uh, targets for advanced persistent threats or ATPs and of course that's uh, an acronym for China, Russia, Iran, North Korea and and uh, teenagers I guess but what's important about this is that in this website there's a link and there's a cost analysis by the defense department and the Defense Department has brought, broken down their cost analysis to what they call endpoint systems of the protected network or the network subject to uh, NIST 171, which of course is a network that handles uh, <clears throat> controlled and unclassified information. And they, they broke it out by endpoints. An endpoint seems to be anybody that can get into the system. So it's it's going to be um, laptops, printers, mobile phones, et cetera. And they estimate the costs for systems or networks that have 25 to 50 endpoints as being uh, $15,000 to process uh, the IT configuration changes. And network isolation, they have at least 10,000, and that's to isolate the network that will, that part of the network that will be handling uh, CUI. And then 250 to 500,000 to create a new network if, uh, if you know, so necessary. And then they have what they call the security operations center slash threat related costs, which as near as I can tell is your um, cybersecurity program. And then of course, if, well not of course, and if you go to 50 to 100 endpoints, it's $50,000 for the IT configuration, 100,000 to isolate, and it goes on and on. Anyway, this is an expensive process. And then of course, as we're all, well, we all know it's an expensive process, but DOD seems to think this is for uh, less than half of a percent of the 69,000 prime contractors that they uh, not, not that identified that they referred to in this uh, memo, and I'm, I'm basically reading from, and that's 3,450 companies to do uh, half a percent times 69. So they seem to think that only 3,450 3, companies are going to be affected. And yet the certification program that they're imposing is at least 300,000. So we have uh, what is known as a delta, and that delta is going to be expensive. And right now, well, it's already been expensive. What we don't know is uh, whether the people at the, uh, the so-called 25 to 30 25 to 50 endpoints are going to be at level one, two, or three. Uh, we'll see. I'll be addressing that uh, also today. If we go to the next slide, this is just uh, for your cocktail conversation. And the uh, reason I put it in here is because we, we've now gone from what started out years ago as a cybersecurity issue and the the initial FAR clause came out, which is referenced later on, saying you got to have a system that does this and it's all voluntary. We've now gone to a supply chain requirement. And in DOD's mind, the prime is responsible for everybody in their supply chain. And everybody in their supply chain is responsible to have a cybersecurity plan that meets level one, two, or three at this stage. I'm not going to get into levels four and five uh, today, uh, but I'll we'll show you how to to prepare for that if necessary. Okay, so that's enough of the 
uh, first bit of your cocktail conversation. And then we have this next slide uh, also for um, cocktail conversation. The Secure Technology Act um, did something uh, I thought kind of silly. It said uh, Homeland Security is to report security vulnerabilities like as if they haven't been doing it already. And what I've given you here is a bunch of sites to the uh, uh, com computer emergency response team, which gives you a weekly vulnerability summary, et cetera, uh, which, by the way, should, I think, your adherence to that, your, your um, uh, subscription to that should be in your cybersecurity plan, uh, because if I was an outside auditor, that's the one thing I'd want to know what, what a uh, company was doing. And then um, we, we've heard of cyber hygiene as a new word. Um, and then right next to it, of course, is cyber resilience. And the CERT, uh, the U.S. CERT site or the DHS site, it is some pretty useful uh, resources. Uh, in, in my estimation, the uh, Department of Homeland Security has provided much more useful information on how to get a useful cybersecurity plan more than any other agency. Uh, it, they, they, of course, focus on the, on the, on the acronym CUI rather than um, of, uh, contractor information or the uh, CDI, contractor uh, uh, covered information, instead of we'll get to later on. But um, that is a very good way, looking at their uh, various uh, resources, will get you past writer's block in terms of putting together a, a good plan if you don't already have one. And then Section 201 of that uh, Secure Technology Act establishes uh, Supply Chain Security Act, which is why I provided those uh, earlier sites. And what this committee can do is uh, uh, review and designate items of services that federal, the federal government can't buy. So you're always going to have this um, cybersecurity overhang. Uh, in my mind, the best way to describe it would be an unfunded mandate and subject to change uh, at any at any time. Now, this last bit of history here is uh, there's at least 20 plus DOD memos, and that's all I have in my files. I have 23 DOD memos starting back in uh, uh, 2016, excuse me, 2017, on uh, getting the plan together. And then I put in this DCMA guidance, which I think many of you know for the uh, <clears throat> contractor purchasing system review, which is now about a $50 million threshold. And all of these DOD memos, uh, there was one that was worth a damn in my estimation. That was an April 2018 one. And then we have the, the, what I call the 2020 bridge to CMMC implementation. And what I mean by implementation is not uh, not the program getting involved. I can tell you a lot about that as we go through here, but it's preparation for the company itself. So if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you, it shows what's in the uh, this uh, Office on the Secretary of Defense, i.e. Long, her memo on assessing contract and implementation. And I've identified as guidance for 2020. That is to say, the guidance that I think you should use as a minimum for preparation for purposes of being uh, certified when this third-party certifier uh, sooner or later comes to your comes to your uh, company um, to issue the cert. Uh, the levels of assessment they have, this is the DOD, are basic, medium, and high. Uh, basic is the FAR clause. Go over that in the, in the next couple of slides. The medium, I have no idea why they have that other than they had to get to high. And high is what would be the current clause, uh, the DFARS clause on having a program that implements at least 110 elements of the NIST 171 revision one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
program that's incorporated in these uh, in, in the contracts that you get. And Annex A is the assessment, that's so you can score yourself. And they have in it. It's not bad, by the way. And it's the and Annex B is the so-called self-assessment because we are still in the self-certification stage. What Annex A is is the April 24 to 18 guidance, which is what I referred to a, a moment ago as the uh, the one that seemed to be worth it of all the things that they had sent out. Uh, DOD is not done a real good job of of getting the uh, um, program enforced or getting the clauses enforced and then I'm not sure what high means at this stage because it, it's at least the 171 requirements I don't know if it's going to include the other 32 requirements that I spoke about earlier for the advanced persistent threats okay now in this Next slide now, now we have to take a mental break here. So now we're in the CMMC itself, the Cybersecurity Model Maturity Certification. Very straightforward uh, name. Their first draft uh, was 58 pages, and then the current draft is 190 pages. That tells you something right away, but it also indicates, uh, and, and, and this is my opinion again, uh, that that the people who are taking over the draft of the CMMC requirements are now understanding and making up for how poorly the uh, system was was implemented. So you can get to that draft, of course, by going to the to the uh, website itself, which is what I've given here in, in the first uh, triangle there, the, the OSD mill slash CMMC, and, and download it. It's uh, fairly well written, uh, which is uh, always a pleasure. And they're talking about a unified cybersecurity standard for DOD. But keep in mind when I said about the NARA office, the Information Security Oversight Office, ISSO, uh, they have to bless this also. And when I talk to those guys, they're telling me that they're getting phone calls, but they're not getting any um, ability to have an input. What that means later on, uh, I, I have no idea, but it's, it's a fact that ISS, ISOO is going to be calling the uh, shots over DOD, and DOD knows this because of the memorandum of understanding they have between the two. But the what the unified cybersecurity standard is, is the, the NIST, uh, a couple of ISOs that are made in there, and then the a couple of uh, publications by uh, CERT, uh, the Computer Emergency Response Team at DHS, and then best practices from uh, CIS, and NDIA, et cetera, et cetera. So that is where CMMC is. So what you should glean from this is that there's a significant difference between CMMC requirements and the NIST requirements. And so that's why you want to go and check out the uh, uh, the NIST, excuse me, the CMMC draft. Okay, now next page is the uh, is, is the, something that we've all seen before. It uh, measures maturity of practices and processes. Uh, fourth bullet talks about certifications from accredited third parties. Now where the system is on that is uh, yesterday was the last day for volunteers to um, apply to the CMMC um, organization. It's got it's cmmc.org. It's got its own website now to be uh, to be auditors, and uh, that's that's the board they're putting together. So at this stage, uh, mid January, CMMC is official and it's funded that's what makes it official and now they're trying to put the people together to go over cmmc version 0.0.7 to make that a uh, first draft version one to do the training 
of the certifiers who can then go out and start certifying companies for purposes of being CMMC certified. And that's relevant because at least in the defense department, if you're not certified, you're not dealing with them anymore. So it's, it's, it, it's now a, uh, a qualification rather than an evaluation factor. Right now, NIST 171, et cetera, with the um, system security plan and the uh, plan of action and milestones, their evaluation factors, um, by the end of this year, you either are or you're not eligible to do a DOD contract. According to CMMC people in their defense department, um, we're talking about 300,000 contractors have to be certified. And that's a lot of, a lot of contractors, but we don't know if it's 300,000 have to be at level one or level three. Level two is uh, a tweener, like I said earlier, between uh, on, on what's the, the DOD approach, but the, the point being that the timing, I don't think they're going to make it on their September timing for the RFP sections LMM range to be seen how they'll, how they'll do. Uh, and also keep in mind, this is everybody in the world. You know, this is all the Europeans or um, Japanese um, suppliers over in Okinawa or Japan and North Korean supply, excuse me, South Korean suppliers. Uh, so when we get to the next slide, we see how the CMMC is working it out. Uh, they got 17 domains, as they put it. NIST has 14, and we have these five maturity levels. So as you as you uh, go through these uh, levels, I've tied them to the clauses that seem to make the most sense. I, I know I know the basic and the FAR clause is straightforward because we're about to go through that. And what they call good cyber hygiene, DOD would call high cyber hygiene because that's the clause we're talking about. And as a practical matter, uh, you know, I'm sorry if I hadn't, haven't said this before, the, the contracting officer will identify the CMMC level that contractors have to be um, certified to. Now, if you're certified to three, then you're also good for levels one and two. That's you know finally been made clear, although it's sort of intuitive. Uh, and if I was a contract officer, I would go to level three because that clause has been around for quite a while, and your you as a company have already supposed to have met that. But meet, meeting that clause means that you got a system security plan and a plan of action and uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, plan of action and mitigation to milestones, I'm sorry, plan of action and milestones to get to the plan that you say you're going to have, which is different from being certified to that level. Okay, so now uh, let me start out with the analysis on level one. That's on the, starts on the next slide. And what I've done here is taken the, the 17 technical controls that are in level one. Now, how do I know there's 17? Well, there's 17 because I went to the DOD memo, Annex A, and they have all the NIST items listed there. And they have an asterisk on the 17 that meet what they call the basic um, what they what they call meets the FAR 202-41 clause. So you go to that memo, you get the list, and you'll see that the, for example, the the FAR clause says uh, limit information system access to authorized users. That's covered in NIST 311, 312, and then we have the next one 31. Point two zero, and you go on down the list. So on the next slide, you'll see that 
I've gone through all of these. And first thing that you should see is that these are all NIST requirements. So DOD has gone through NIST 171 and identified the 17 technical requirements they think your information system has to have if it's handling CUI or uh, you know contractor uh, data, or DOD data, et cetera, that's considered CUI. And all this is supposed to be according to the uh, DOD DFAR clause, all that's supposed to be identified by the contract officer. And the source of this, of course, is this OUSD memo, uh, which is Annex A. So now we go to the next slide, and I've done the same thing with level two. And the level one had 17 technical controls, level two has 72 technical controls. And I've used this, and, and I know this, of course, because I've been to the <clears throat> DOD memo, and I've compared it to the NIST uh, requirements, 110 requirements. And I, so I don't go through every one of them, of course. Uh, but I wanted you to know that under uh, this least privilege and awareness and training, password, et cetera, you see three new non-NIST requirements. And the UK has a has a cyber essentials program. And, and by the way, the UK already has a uh, certified plan, excuse me, a, cert, a certification process. And then the CERT or the resilience management model is the awareness and training and there's two NIST requirements. And then you go to version uh, 1.2 of the CERT resilience management model and you read a particular uh, area under that. And, and this site is the shorthand site. They, they, the, uh, the CMMC guidance will tell you exactly exactly where to go. Uh, password, then we have the uh, UK again, and that's where we are for level two. Now on the next slide, I've pretty much done the same thing, uh, but I've said, I'm saying that level three, what they call good cyber hygiene, is equal to the DFAR .204-7012 clause, which would be in DOD language, the high level. And now we have 131 technical controls to safeguard the CDI, the uh, uh, contractor defense information, which is essentially anything that goes on your system that does or may handle or store or transfer um, covered defense information. And in those examples, I'll go through, you'll see I have NIST again, the UK, and now we've got the Australians. And we have the first reference under encryption to the FIP standards. So that is how you go from one level to another. And then finally, on email protection, we've got uh, the uh, Center for Internet Security Critical Security Critical Security Controls Volume 7.1, obviously recent, and then uh, the the CMMC template shows another source of CMMC, and that is we talked uh, mentioned earlier. That's 191 pages. Well, that's all described in there. The actual template, uh, excuse me, the actual grid for meeting the requirements. It's only about 25 pages. Um, so that, that's why I was saying earlier that the that going to the CMMC website, downloading um, version 0.7 will give you some, some excellent uh, information for purposes of putting your plan together and essentially getting past the, the security system plan, the SSP, which is all you've had to do for the last couple of years, and the plan of action and milestones, 
which is all you've had to do for the last couple of years for purposes of the NIST standards. And now you've got a new standard under email protection. So go to the next slide. We're actually starting to summarize things here. The purpose of this is to explain that at the CMMC levels, one, two, or three, you still have contract requirements. Uh, DFAR-7008 clause is a clause that says, submit the offer, you're certifying that you will implement the uh, NIST 171 Revision 1 standards. And that will implement is why the, the plan of action and milestones was, would enable people, if they were ever challenged, uh, to say this is what we plan to do and this is what we plan to do it. And when we get to the DFAR 204-12, which is supposed to be 7,012, that's a typo on, on my part, I apologize for it. You have the, the NIST standard, well, I gave you the SSPN POAM, and, it, and that applies to the contract defense information, which is marked by the CEO. One of the things that I'm anticipating, and this is in conversations with contract officers is uh, they're the ones that have to mark what's CDI and what's not. And that's where your obligation uh, arises with respect to specific information. So be sure that you know what is being marked and is not being marked. Put that in one of your pre-proposal questions if it comes up or call them up if it's going to be a contract change and, and get that sorted out. Then the clause also says uh, you have to report a cyber incident within 72 hours. And to do that, you have to have a medium assurance certificate. So until you have that certificate, which is just a website application, then you uh, have to uh, you have to have that in order to do the cyber reporting. And then of course the flow down throughout the entire supply chain. Now I'm using the phrase uh, throughout the entire supply chain, because that was in the Q&A that DOD put out in um, on January 2017 has never been never been changed, um, and, and and that's that's one of the memos that I was referring to earlier when I said there's about 20 plus, and then we have the supply chain risk clause, which says that the contractor will mitigate supply chain risk. Okay, that's straightforward enough. That's what 70012 do, 70012 does. Uh, but that clause allows the government to come in and say, we checked out this source that you've identified and you can't use that or you're not going to get a contract. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, the, the clause will say that the government has the right under a given statute to investigate who's in your supply chain which means they have to ask about the supply chain. Um, so uh, keep that in mind because from a procurement aspect, if, if the government uh, has the clause in here and they have the right to exclude a source, if they have to tell you that, I would think, because it hasn't been contested yet, they would have to tell you that before they make an award. If they come after award, then it's a change uh, versus some kind of uh, no cost change, as we are all familiar with. And then on the last slide, try to give uh, a little information on uh, preparing. This is uh, it's a, one more slide, the last slide. Um, Jennifer, thank you. This is preparing for the third party audit. Uh, and the third party audit is by these uh, individuals who have yet to be identified or trained uh, who will be coming around and saying your system meets level one, two, or three. And that's the system, and like I said earlier, that's the uh, network, uh, excuse me, the, the supply chain risk management system that you're gonna have to have in place to meet level one, two, or three, which is what the, uh, um, government will be telling you. So look at your current status. 
that's um, pretty straightforward. So that's, you know, do you use a VPN to have a password, et cetera, and what's in your inventory? That's always the first step. And then, of course, you're going to have to have a network vulnerability assessment done because that is going to be your, your baseline to identify where you do or do not meet the NIST standards or the CIS standard or the UK standard or the Australian standard that has been identified in the uh, CMMC grid, which is now um, draft uh, 0 0.7. And then with uh, the system security plan, I've provided that another site where people can go and start getting something to um, get from a concept on what you want to do to a piece of paper that explains what you have. And for level three, it's pretty clear that the certifier is going to want you to go through it. <laughs> so if level three says something on, uh, if you go back to the earlier slides, it says something about email protection, and it gives the, the NIST standards and the SIM standard and the CIS standard, then you're going to have to be able to show that certifier that the system that you have meets that as a uh, technical, practical, dem demonstrable uh, manner versus what we have now, which is just a piece of paper that says, yes, we meet that or that's your system security plan, or it says, yes, we, we meet X that we haven't gotten to Y, which is in our plan of action and milestones. So that's um, how, to, how to do it. And if you're a two or three person outfit, uh, you've got a lot of night work coming up. But sooner or later, you're gonna have to pay for a, a vulnerability assessment now, when we did ours at, at the law firm, it was $1,800, and it uh, covered our system plus um, Office 365. That this is to give you give you an idea of of that particular cost, and I've already gone over the cost that um, DoD anticipates the various number of. Uh, of uh, endpoints that you have uh, for, for some reason people have wanted to know if that cost that you put into your system is um, allowable and the answer obviously yes because it's a contract requirement and then the next question is, is it reasonable and the reason that's a question is because you're going to take the the cost to implement your system security plan and amortize that over a period, of what I would say three years, and then equipment at five years. Now, that's, those are DCA's numbers for software and hardware. Now, whether or not DCA will allow you to do that, well, first you gotta be audited, and then uh, second, uh, you'll have their own uh, you know, contract audit manual to throw back at them, so it, I, I don't anticipate that ever being a problem. Uh, the problem would be, to use an extreme example, is you, your equipment for your new system security plan includes uh, your new Jaguar or BMW or something that you call from once in a while for purposes of getting in, into, the, uh, into your network. Um, and on that, uh, I'll end it because I'm not allowed to talk more than I have. And if you uh, have any questions, just uh, send, me, send me an email. And I'll be uh, I'll be happy to, to respond to you. And uh, thank you for listening, and Jennifer. Thank you uh, for setting this up and giving me the opportunity. And otherwise, have a good day. Take care. Super. Thank you, David, for the uh, the great information. Thanks everybody who attended. If you have questions about CMMC, cybersecurity, anything related to that, please contact David Dempsey. 
contact information is there on the screen. It's C Dempsey at uh, D E F T L A W dot com, and his phone number is seven zero three eight eight zero nine one seven one. I think we have two more Wednesdays uh, in January, and we are continuing to cover this hot topic from different speakers. Next month, we dig into OTAs. Uh, so please visit our website to get the full list of all of the webinars uh, and the registration links. Again, they are all complimentary. They're all recorded, and we'll hopefully have today's recording up uh, this evening or uh, by Thursday or Friday this week. Thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you next time. Okay. Take care.